CNT 120, Chapter 4. We're moving into the encryption protocol part of the chapter. So they remind us that data exists in three states, rest, use, and motion. Um, and they say that, you know, data is really the most secure when it's stored. Um, you think about on, on your hard drive in a locked room, maybe even encrypted on your hard drive kind of thing. Um, but in use, that's where we typically want to be able to get to it to actually use it but that's where the risk starts um so how do we how do we make sure that only the intended person is using it um if i have some authentication i'm reducing the risk of other people that shouldn't be accessing the data get access to it uh when we're moving it whether it be you know email or something like that this is the most vulnerable um, so as soon as it leaves, you know, like my system or my trusted, you know, network, if you will, and moves across links, that's when we're at risk. And that's where your encryption protocols come in. Um, if I have some encryption protocols on there, I'm minimizing that risk. So encryption is really my last means of defense. You know, as that data leaves my computer, um, if I encrypt it, I'm, it's my last way to try to make sure that people that aren't supposed to have this data, they don't get it. Now, encryption protocols use a mathematical code called a cipher to take my data and scramble it in a format that's not readable. However, if I do that in a certain mathematical form or mathematical manner, um, I can actually reverse that process at the other end called decrypting. Um, and the purpose of this is really to keep my data private, especially if I'm like emailing something. I would encrypt it on my end. As you get it, you decrypt it. So anybody in the middle might, might get a hold of it, but they can't read it. It's scrambled in a way they don't understand. Um, Encryption is going to provide the following assurances, confident, confidentiality, data can only be viewed by the intended recipient, um, integrity, data was not modified, so, you know, if I send it, um, encrypt it, and you get it, and you can't decrypt it, well, maybe that data got corrupted, or maybe it was trying to be modified in transit, um, and availability, data is available and accessible to the intended recipient when they need it, um, that's what encryption is all about. And that's the the CIA triad, triad here: confidentiality, integrity, availability. Now, with encryption, we're going to talk about private key and public key. So, real quickly, key is your random string of characters that we use to scramble the data. Um, this is the part that kind of gets people a little confused. I'm going to give you an example here in a minute. Um, this is used to generate our cipher text, our encrypted text, if you will. This key, this key is created in a special manner um, that, that, you know, this gets substituted, then this gets changed, and this gets changed, and this gets changed. If that gets done a certain process, that process can be reversed on the other end. Um, and that that is the algorithm. That's the how am I encrypting, how am I decrypting. And the cipher text really is my encrypted data, my scrambled data block. Well, a lot of people have trouble kind of visualizing this, so I, I'll use a simple example. Um, if we use a simple cipher, we can kind of see what's happening, and there's multiple different types out there, but I'll use this one as just an example. If we do the rotate by 13 cipher, we have, you know, this, this was my uh, original letter that I'm going to use. Um, my rotate by 13 says, okay, take this letter and replace it by the 13th one in the alphabet. So I basically just replace it by the 13th one down. Then this gets replaced by 13 more down the line. So it basically just shifts it all down by 13 places. So a simple word of hello, if I replace, well, H becomes U, um, E becomes R, L becomes Y. So this here appears to somebody as being totally unreadable. Um, this is a super simple cipher, but the idea is I'm making it not readable. Um, that's your routine by 13 cipher. Uh, a lot of people encounter this, especially if you have um, posts online and people don't want to spoil the ending of a game or ending of a movie. They might actually do the routine by 13 cipher and put something like this out there that you can't read it unless you purposely go, you know, uh, decrypt it, if you will. It's not hard to decrypt, but um, I'm not going to accidentally discover that, um, you know, the ring was stolen or so-and-so was, was killed in, you know, and that's the murder mystery and we figured out who did it or whatever. Um, this a lot of times gets used to, to protect those spoilers. 
Um, now, I do have a fun message here, and if you do put it in the Rotate by 13 cipher, you can learn my fun message. I'll leave that up to you. But that is essentially what an encryption cipher is. That is an encryption algorithm. Now, this is the most simplest one, and reversing it takes no effort whatsoever. So to get something to be more secure, this has to become more complicated. But it's the same concept. It's the same concept, that, okay, I'm going to take one thing here and replace it with something else, or change it, or slide it down the line, or replace it with this bit sequence. I'll take this bit sequence and I'll replace it with this bit se sequence. Um, that's the idea behind encryption, because then you can repeat that process backwards on the other end. Um, unfortunately, with computers, the processing has gotten so good, these these encryption ciphers have to get more complex, more complex, more complex um, to make it harder for them to brute force or crack them. Now, for some fun side reading for people that are interested in security, um, here's a Caesar cipher. This is your Caesar shift cipher, um, as in Julius Caesar. Okay, this is some early, early encryption. Um, if you're interested in the early history of the United States, your um, during the Revolutionary War, there was a spy ring that used its own substitution cipher. Uh, the Culper Code. Uh, this was a fascinating read for me a number of years ago. Um, I kind of waded into this, so maybe check that one out. That's the Culper spy ring that operated in, um, you know, the 1770s, 1776, if you will. Um, and then the code book they used for their substitution cipher. Uh, some of these concepts are still taught in security and in, uh, I think it's CIA and so forth. Uh, some of those concepts are still taught there. So let's now mention key encryption uh uh, uh, private key encryption and public key encryption. Well, pi private key encryption is very much what we just d got done saying. I'm going to encrypt by a certain manner, and the other end, I'm going to decrypt with that same manner. You know, kind of going the other direction. Um, with private key encryption, I'm using the same key. I'm using the same process to encrypt as I'm doing decrypt. Um, examples of this would be AES, DES, triple DES. Um, the problem with this, though, is I need to somehow get the private key to the recipient. So I, before I send my message, I use the private encryption key that I need to get it to you in some manner for you to decrypt it. That's one of the catches behind uh, the private key or symmetric key encryption. Um, and here's just a reminder, plain text, secret key is used to encrypt, and I use the same secret key to decrypt on the other end. Meanwhile, there's public key encryption. Now, public key, I'm going to use two keys. I'm going to use one to encrypt, and I'm going to use a different one to decrypt. I'll use the public key to encrypt, and as the data comes to me, I will use the private key. I'm the only one that has it to decrypt. Um, so I actually make the public key available out there for, you know, you to encrypt the message and send it to me, and then I keep the private key. I'm the only one that keeps it um, to decrypt what comes to me. Um, so I'm the only one that can decrypt that message coming in. So I do need to put that key out in some manner for you to get to, and that's where your certificate authority uh, would do for that. Here are some examples of public key encryption. We'll see some of this when we start doing like packet captures of, of uh, 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 data coming from the Internet. And here's some other ones that you run across as well, uh, especially SSH and so forth. We'll be looking at some of that a little bit later too. So here, uh, the book I noticed had a little tidbit so I put or a little tidbit wrong so I put little bubbles in here to kind of get you sorted out uh, before the sender sends data to the receiver the sender is going to use the public key from the public key server certificate authority they will get that public key encrypt it and then it comes to the receiver you know like me if you will and I'll use the private key that I have to decrypt the message um, so I, I can put my public key out there at a certificate authority for people to get and encrypt the message and once they do they can't decrypt it they don't have the private key once it comes to me then I can decrypt it um, that's your it's your public key encryption So my certificate authorities, places like VeriSign, can be holding my public key, my public uh, encryption keys, um, and they can be the one to say, "Yes, this is legit. This is this is verified. Here is their public encryption key," and that's all part of the public key infrastructure. And I put them out there because a lot of people have seen them with uh, doing uh, 
transactions online, especially financial transactions online. Transactions online, you'll see them, the VeriSign down in the corner of a page or something like that. All right, so there's our introduction to encryption.